Last week, my young friend Nick Norwitz invited me to join him in Boston to meet with Walter Willett, the longtime head of the School of Public Health at Harvard and a giant in the field of nutrition. Nick and I have a very unlikely friendship because he practices a ketogenic diet, which can have a lot of animal foods. I am all about plant-dominant diets, low in animal foods, especially beef, as is Walter. But how great is it that a 78-year-old nutrition professor and a 28-year-old med student can have a respectful conversation, find common ground, and openly debate differences? Nick is also a capable researcher, having already earned a PhD from Oxford. His research is in carbohydrate restriction as a metabolic health intervention. He got fascinated by why some lean people see their LDL cholesterol rocket on a ketogenic diet. So, based on research with his colleagues, including interventional trials and a meta-analysis of 41 randomized control trials, Nick performed a dramatic experiment on himself that only he would do. And he showed that adding Oreos to his diet, yum, lowered his LDL cholesterol more than a high-dose statin did. What? There is a lot of sensational language around Nick's experiment on social media, which Nick says was sort of the point to provoke curiosity. But I had a hunch that Nick and Walter could have a sane, rational conversation, so I filmed it. Walter is no stranger to sensational language surrounding some of his publications. He published a paper on red meat and diabetes recently, which was like a shot fired around the world for the press with sensational rebuttals on social media. So the two had a lot to talk about. Walter's paper is the subject of my next episode, and I'm going deep. This episode is part of a much longer conversation Nick had with Walter, which I'll publish in the future. While in Boston, I interviewed a few other fascinating scientists, and I'll publish episodes about them when I get a chance. Oh, thank you, Professor Willett, for having me in your house. I'm really excited to talk to you. Being a scientific communicator in now 2024, where you want to, you know, as a responsible academic, present a nuanced point of view. At the same time, you're competing with the forces that be in social media, which deals with things that will get the most engagement that are simple for people with short attention spans and are clickbaity. It's really interesting to be a um, young scientist and med student in this era because that is, you know, a, a portion of my future that I see as part of my career. It's something that I'm really passionate about and something that I, I think I, you know, could do a good job of, but it's something that every day I struggle with. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a case study in this, I wanted to describe to you a little, let's call it legit bait that I've generated, mm -hmm. which I think you're aware of and just get your, your honest, wise and critical feedback mm -hmm. on some of the issues that, you know, have gone through my head with respect to it. So, if I may, um, this experiment, it was an N equals one experiment I'm doing on myself. And I announced it a priori actually on um, this channel, Plant Chompers, um, over the summer. I'm, I'm gonna give you a, uh, a thumbnail or, or clickbait to <laughs> entice people. So this, this is the keto guy at Harvard Medical School, doctor, PhD scientist, who's on the Oreo yeah. cookie diet. <laughs> so Oreo cookies, and here's a statin. I'm gonna explain for a minute. Is it, um, you're gonna give me an all caps headline, keto dieter yeah. abandons keto and goes all Oreos. <laughs> All right, there's your thumbnail. <laughs> I will first clarify the spirit and intent of the study, which was to um, productively provoke engagement in a subject and topic about which I am passionate and so excited to study every day, which is a phenotype called lean mass hyperresponders and something called the lipid energy model. I can dig into what that means in a minute, but that's not really the point. The point is, there's something I'm studying that I find very, very cool. Mm -hmm. And I want to share that nerd enthusiasm with as many people as possible. Hook them in mm -hmm. and engage them in the topic. And to do that, I know I need something that will turn heads mm -hmm. and get people to look and ask questions. Mm -hmm. So force people to deal with uncomfortable questions, force science to deal with uncomfortable questions because that's what science should do. 
deal with uncomfortable questions. So over the past couple of years, we've been developing some research um, on this, this phenotype. We started with a cohort study, um, which you had some very insightful questions about when I presented it at Harvard. Now, that was, I guess, 2021, so a couple of years ago now. And then the, the literature has been growing. We have even like a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials. So we have high tier literature, but again, that doesn't necessarily translate to every person. So mm -hmm. I envisioned what I could imagine as the most provocative way to demonstrate mm -hmm. um, our model, which is, you know, our, our model predicts that cholesterol will go up on a ketogenic diet, particularly in lean, otherwise healthy people, because carbs go low in the liver, the, the carb stores go low, and that forces the liver to increase the systemic fat trafficking, which results in these very low density lipoprotein particles that eventually get turned over into LDL. And the result of this turnover is this lean mass hyperresponder triad, the high LDL, the high HDL, and the low triglycerides. Now, keeping it very simple, a, a prediction is that you add back carbs, liver glycogen stores go up, and the driving force for the high LDL will go back down. We've seen this before in a case study of five patients in an interventional trial. We're adding back carbs, more in a carb swap kind of way, so you swap out the fats, causes the LDL to go down. But an extension of this will be to ask questions like, will any carb work? Can it be unhealthy carbs? And um, if it, would it work as just a pure addition, so not swapping out fat, fat stays the same or even goes up, and how does it compare to standard of care therapy, so statins? Mm -hmm. And so what I decided to do, because I'm of this phenotype, is a crossover trial where I compare consumption of Oreo cookie, just standard Oreo cookies, mm -hmm. to high intensity statin therapy. And for my own protection, <laughs> um, you know, I, I tried to do this in as above board a manner as possible. So I went to the IRB to get the IRB exemption. My PCP was monitoring, ordering my test. I had a um, cardiologist, lipidologist consult, announced everything a priori. And to cut to the chase, the results that will have dropped by the time this podcast airs is that in only 16 days, Oreo cookies lowered my cholesterol, my LDL cholesterol by 71% which was twice as potent in effect as high intensity statin therapy, six weeks of 20 milligrams for suvastatin. So I'm anticipating a lot of news coverage, mm -hmm. Harvard medical mm -hmm. scientist student, Harvard medical student scientist lowers cholesterol with Oreo cookies. Mm -hmm. You can see why that's provocative mm -hmm. and how the narrative could get away from me. Mm -hmm. So I've described what I've done we can get into more than nitty gritty with respect to the results, but I guess my main question for you, first of all, is, is this a responsible and fair thing to do? Because mm -hmm. I'm not even sure I know the answer to that right mm -hmm. now. And how does one, you know, control the narrative and direct the, um, the story and the questioning, or is that not necessarily even possible? Is this something that, you know, I'm playing with fire and it can just get away from me and create more damage than good, even if my intention is just to get people curious? Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was a lot, but. <laughs> right. Um, well, they, yeah, that's a very good question. And um, I, I simply don't know the answer to <laughs> a bigger question. Uh, can you control the narrative or does this uh, get away from you and distract from things that are really important? I guess the distraction element is, is probably the biggest concern here mm -hmm. uh, because I'm sure you will add lots of caveats that this doesn't mean that Oreo cookies are good for you. It doesn't mean that you should gain weight to have, reduce this adverse effect mm -hmm. uh, that, or uh, to reduce the adverse effect of, uh, high, of uh, saturated fat and unhealthy fats in the diet, the flip of what you're talking about. The media has evolved so much over the last decade or so, it's, it's I find really unpredictable that we used to get, uh, as you know, most of our information through a few channels. If we read one or two newspapers, and there were a couple of main TV channels, uh, three big networks, and uh, they weren't that much different, and that's how we got our information. But it's pretty wild out there. It is a Wild West kind of situation, and, uh, and in some ways that's, uh, well, every bit of the media is 
trying to create hype and sensationalism and, as you say, clickbait mm -hmm. uh, that is usually focused on the least reliable information. So I think what you're talking about is part of a bigger picture, that uh, a, a real problem, that the most reliable information that we have is not the first study on a topic, it's the second or third confirmatory study. And, um, uh, and then, of course, it, uh, things that are, you know, uh, man biting dog is what gets the, the headlines rather than the opposite way. And um, it, it does, it, it creates this whole milieu that's uh, distracting, uh, putting attention on things that are not so important. Uh, and uh, I, I think, and the public is off, what I hear is, uh, we don't know what to believe. I'm throwing up my hands. I'll just eat what I want to eat. Uh, and that's, for, of course, a dangerous outcome because what's out there to eat is mostly pretty unhealthy food. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, is this, uh, are you playing with fire here that you can't extinguish uh, or not? It'll, I guess there'll be a, 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 something to pay attention to, Yeah. <laughs> what the reaction is. That, that in itself would be an interesting study, perhaps. Yeah. It's something, I mean, no matter what, I'm going to learn something from this process. Um, it's it's really funny to, to talk to different people and see their reactions about like what could happen and something that often comes up, which I, I thought about at the beginning, but I'm surprised by just how much it comes up is, oh, are you going to confuse people into thinking Oreo cookies are healthy or it's healthy to overeat carbs, like refined junk food carbs? This even came from a reviewer where they're like, you haven't clarified enough that eating excess refined carbs is probably a bad thing. And I'm like, isn't it implicit? Mm -hmm. Like, isn't this just, can I not rely on basic human common sense? The whole point, like I said earlier, is can, yeah, I'm not making a health claim. I'm drawing a very uncomfortable tension between the fact that this bad intervention, which we can all agree is not a healthy thing, to have your baseline diet, because this is a pure add-on, and then eat, for me it was about 640 calories every single day extra to my diet in pure Oreo cookies. Mm -hmm. No one thinks it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, mm -hmm. it reduced my LDL, which people see as good, mm -hmm. a lot. So how do we hold these two things yeah. at the same time? Even if it's just a single patient case, mm -hmm. you know, how do we make sense of that? It's the very uncomfortable question that I want to draw out, which is what makes it provocative. And it's funny how people need to then, mm -hmm. there's a drive to reduce it to this is good or this is bad, or you're drawing this conclusion or you're drawing that conclusion. I mentioned earlier with respect to your comment about, you know, the Gila monster venom and, mm -hmm. and um, the GLP-1 receptor agonists. This for me, you, you know, it's not like most people aren't low carb. Among those, most aren't lean. Okay. This isn't directly clinically relevant mm -hmm. to the vast majority listening. So I was asked by, by one journalist, you know, why, why is this meaningful? Like, how can I sell this as an interesting story? Mm -hmm. And I said... This is a story about scientific pursuit, about shock and awe, about seeing something that is so weird mm -hmm. that you can't look away and you need to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about mm -hmm. for me. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just, it's just a, a difficult thing to do because it's such a rock and a hard place situation with respect to, to any narrative around health and nutrition. And you want to show people how novel and interesting this is, but in order to do that, it does require some degree of, of flair. And you don't want to like overstep and become too much of a caricature of yourself, but you can't just stay too reserved and overly, prof overly professional is a weird way to put it, but you know what I mean, yeah. where, where it's not engaging. Because then the risk of that is those who are willing to be entirely hyperbolic and aren't worried about their academic credibility, they can run with the narrative. Right. And that's even more dangerous. Yeah, this is, it is a serious issue, and actually it's uh, 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 one of the, it, it's a strategy, uh, sort of the novelty of it uh, is a strategy the New York Times uses, and I think uh, in an irresponsible way, that Gina Colada is a, probably the major offender here, that's it's always, the basic bottom line is scientists got it wrong. Uh, and uh, and here's, here's, here's the right thing. And maybe at the very end paragraph, there'll be a qualifying sentence or something. Oh, this needs to be replicated or something like that. But because uh, I, I think it does have the potential of uh, leading to distrust of science. 
uh, that in most of these situations, no, scientists got it right that in general, like you're saying, uh, it's better to be not overweight, or which of course Gina Colada says in her headline, so it's fine to be overweight or even obese. Uh, but um, uh, there's a huge amount of data that it's, it's better to be not overweight or obese, and that in general it's uh, the type of fat is important in the diet, the type of carbohydrate is important in the diet. But, uh, but there are some things here that uh, are surprising findings in sort of a pretty extreme situations that uh, we don't understand, and it, would be, it, it could be helpful. We don't know where this is going to go. It could be helpful to uh, complete our picture uh, of how diet affects our long-term health and well-being, but it doesn't mean that we should change Necessary. It doesn't mean we should gain weight to avoid this reaction. <laughs> I would not recommend that. <laughs> it's. It was interesting to, to hear you say just now how they like to have the headline "scientists got it wrong," because my impression is often a lot of scientists, at least the good ones, are like you said, humble about what they're putting forth and the scope of what it means. So for me, I'm not claiming anything really other than this is cool and this is interesting from my little experiment. Nevertheless. In general, people like to translate, let's just say the nuance and the caveats are lost in the headline. Right. But then that headline enters the zeitgeist. So then when something else comes out, what they're really doing is not reinterpreting the science as it was qualified, but reinterpreting the own narrative that the media then presented, yeah. which is kind of a, a weird meta mm -hmm. challenge and definitely unfair from a scientific perspective. But... Uh, you right. say that all the time. It, it is challenging. So uh, I, I think to um, when you when this comes out and you are talking to the press, it is really important to, as you say, you plan to do to put the caveats there uh, that uh, this is uh, it, it is sort of an unusual situation of people, who, someone who is quite lean to begin with and a very low uh, carbohydrate diet to start with and uh, sort of a, a stress test that we, uh, in general, wouldn't be a good diet. And, um, and then, of course, of course, the important question is that it looks like this is a, if we're only looking at LDL, uh, that's, uh, it is a surprising effect that most of us wouldn't have predicted. And uh, therefore, it's uh, useful to try to understand that. Uh, but uh, not that we would recommend that. We have lots of evidence that uh, uh, again, the, the type of fat that we consume is very important, um, and it's a short-term study. What, it, what these changes would even mean in the long run is uh, not at all clear. And probably, in fact, probably looking at the long-term implications, probably not a good thing to be doing in the long no. run. Almost, unless there was um, a lot of other evidence to I, show otherwise. I couldn't think of a single scenario where it would be ethical to do this in the long term, even on oneself. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, with respect to the caveats, I'm saying all the time, and it's literally written on the graphical abstract at the bottom with little like caution signs, like this is a metabolic demonstration. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're not recommending this. Yeah. So nevertheless, that probably will get lost at some level. But it is interesting talking about long-term consequences because one of the reasons this, I think, will gain a lot of traction is it's actually layered against another provocative question, which is in a population study of people like me who are low-carb but relatively lean, um, low-carb for therapeutic reasons. My use case was inflammatory bowel disease, and the ketogenic diet was very effective. It was the only thing that was really effective. So I'm kind of like stuck here, so to speak. If I could have a sweet potato, people ask this all the time to lower my LDL, I would. I love them. I have no problem with them. But um, uh, this study that um, the baseline data just dropped, a study out of UCLA that was looking at people like me. So Nick was beginning to move on to other studies, and I'll publish those studies sometime in the future. Can I just say the tragedy of the Oreo experiment is that Nick didn't even enjoy the Oreos? What is wrong with him? If I had to sacrifice my body on behalf of science by eating Oreos, I would have enjoyed every little morsel. I haven't had Oreos in decades, but I still remember how delicious they are. No wonder Americans can't give them up. 